VR is dead. It's not evolving, it's a failed idea. They said the same about internet and email. No doubt some people actually believe it, but in most cases, it's just an easy way to get clicks. Maybe we just need a bit of context to really understand how far we've come. In just a decade, we've gone from extremely simple experiences like this, all the way to modern technological marvels like the Quest 3 and AAA games that we never thought possible in VR. So, for all you VR fans, this is a breakdown of the past, present and future of virtual reality. The first concept of VR actually came out nearly two centuries ago. In the 1830s, Charles Wheatstone was the first one to explain the concept of binocular vision and construct the mirror stereoscope. He laid the foundation of VR and the same concept is being used today, of course with a lot of modern touches. Since then, new devices, research and experiments kept happening. But the true starting point for modern VR technology was in 2011, when an 18-year-old student named Paul Lucky announced the Oculus Rift. And just like Amazon, Apple and several other giants, Oculus was founded in a garage. Lucky wasn't new to the VR thing either. He built his first VR headset in 2009 and it took two years to perfect it. That is when he came up with the idea of the Oculus Rift DK1, a prototype that would include insane features like geometric pre-distortion, wide stereoscopic field of view, a bunch of sensors to track movements and much more. He was so excited about this project that he dropped out of college to turn it into an entire company and mass produce the Oculus Rift. For context, the latest and greatest phone at the time was the iPhone 5, which feels like a relic at this point but realistically wasn't that long ago. So having such an advanced VR headset it was blowing people's minds. But in 2012, Lucky realized that such a small startup wouldn't just work with motivation and dedication. It also required a lot of capital. He didn't want more investors because they only bring in more problems than solutions. So as a last resort, he decided to put the project in the hands of the people and launch a Kickstarter campaign. To his surprise, the campaign brought in $2.5 million, which was far more than he ever dreamt of. For the next few years, he continued to work tirelessly. The product was popular for the time, but resources were running scarce once again, so the timing for what was about to happen was interesting to say the least. In 2014, Facebook, or what we now know as Meta, acquired Oculus for $2 billion. Lucky continued working there for another two years before being let go. At first, there wasn't much hope because VR itself was still in a developmental phase. Now, Facebook, a social media platform, owns the biggest VR company in the world and it just left people confused. But to everyone's surprise, Facebook did more for Oculus and VR technology than anybody else. Many say that after Facebook bought Oculus, history was made because VR gained momentum rapidly afterwards. As soon as they took the reins, Meta started to invest billions of dollars into developing this technology. And even after more than 10 years, their profit and loss statements are still in the red. However, because developing this technology isn't easy by any means, the progress they've made until now is mind-blowing. Many other companies also emerged trying to get ahead of the competition during these 10 years. But only a select few survived. Ever since they acquired Oculus in 2014, Meta knew the potential this revolutionary technology had and, well, money wasn't a problem for Facebook. Sony had released the PS4 in 2013 and the following year they announced Project Morpheus or what we now know as the PSVR 1, though that would take a few more years to cook. Also in 2014, Google released the Google Cardboard, which was absurd but super cool at the same time. Of course, it didn't have all the bells and whistles the expensive stuff had, but it worked. I guess that's what matters at such a low price point. It wasn't meant to be a game changer. It just made VR accessible to everyone so people could get a glimpse of the technology. That way, they could decide whether VR headsets were the right choice for them or not. The experiences were limited to a few immersive videos, some mini games, and a couple of roller coasters, but it was still a really cool buy for the price. In 2015, Samsung also threw their hat in the ring with the Gear VR, which used the Galaxy smartphone as its guts. Those years, it really felt like companies were starting to take VR seriously. Still, the majority of buyers were enthusiasts. A lot of people either didn't understand VR completely or they just never bothered to try it. Plus, it was still in the very early days. People also started to explore the plethora of possibilities with VR. Cratesmith, an independent developer, literally paired the Oculus Rift with a Wii balance board and recreated the hoverboard scene from Back to the Future. But this was just the beginning. Nobody knew that VR was going to become so popular that even the White House would start using it.
In 2015, the Washington Post released a VR experience of the Oval Office at the White House Correspondents' Association dinner. This was a defining moment since VR had expanded from the hands of tech nerds like us to the President of the United States. The mainstream media also dipped their toes in the world of VR. Wall Street Journal launched a VR roller coaster that followed the ups and downs of the Nasdaq stock market. The stock traders went absolutely crazy when this happened because it was the most unique way anybody had ever watched the market trends in history. Slowly but surely, the market was getting the hang of VR. Artists and movie directors started to jump on the trend and launch short films, 360 videos, and immersive content solely for VR use. In October 2016, Sony finally releases the PSVR 1 priced at $400, which was a great deal when compared to the other options available in the market. For example, the HTC Vive, which was also released around the same time, was priced at $800 on launch. It cost double the price and required a ton of stuff to set it up. Base stations, a powerful PC, and a decently sized play space for the tracking to work properly. On the other hand, the PSVR 1 was a plug-and-play accessory for the PS4 and PS4 Pro models. It required a camera and the PlayStation Move controllers, and it was designed as more of a couch VR experience. Moreover, it didn't have a lot of content to keep users engaged. Therefore, it slowly started to become just a boring accessory. I still remember buying it soon after release just to sell it a couple of months later because there were almost no games available. Nonetheless, it was a cool project and laid another brick in the foundation of what VR would become in the next few years. That same year, a bunch of companies, startups and established manufacturers started to launch their own VR headsets. The Pimax 4K took the market by storm, primarily because of its insane specs. As the name suggested, it came with 4K screens which was unheard of in 2016. But unfortunately, it didn't come with a lot of the fancy stuff. Positional tracking wasn't available, it just offered 3DOF tracking, and the screens were amazing in terms of resolution and field of view, but still limited to 60Hz refresh rates, which wasn't great. For high-end gaming users, this wasn't a must-purchase device, but it still had a serious impact on the market. It set the foundation for Pimax's future VR headsets, which we'll discuss in a bit. So VR was slowly evolving and more content was being made for it. Enthusiasts were eagerly waiting for more companies to dip their toes in the VR world. Behind the scenes, Facebook and its multi-billion dollar investment in VR was cooking something special. From the very start, their goal was clear. They were here to conquer the VR world, not just launch headsets and sell them like any other company. In 2017, we had a large wave of Windows Mixed Reality headsets like the Lenovo Explorer, the Dell Visor, and the Samsung Odyssey, but none of them were particularly game-changing. Although they were still a step forward in pushing VR technology and defining what it would look like in the years to come. So, in 2018, Facebook took the first step towards taking the reins of the VR game. They wanted to show the world what they've been up to behind the scenes. That's when they unveiled their newest prototype, the Half Dome. Advanced optics, a crazy 140-degree field of view, and overall specs that were never seen before in the VR space. But unfortunately, it remained only a prototype. Impressive, but not nearly ready for the market. The silver lining was that it gave investors confidence that Mark Zuckerberg was heading in the right direction with Oculus. Pimax started getting serious as well, releasing their newest headset, the 5K Plus, the same year. The following year, a new generation of the Oculus Rift was introduced, the Rift S. Facebook made several key changes to this model, including a better resolution, reduced screen door effect, and more. One of the highlights of the Oculus Rift S was its inside-out tracking via five built-in cameras. Previously, the original Oculus Rift came with external tracking. The evolution of VR by this time was so big that even Forbes wrote an article about how quickly the world was adopting this new technology. They named the entire year of 2019 as the year when virtual reality got real. And keep in mind, this was less than six years ago. That same year, Valve blew everyone's minds with the Index, which is still one of the most popular PC VR headsets of all time. It completely changed the game with its insane ease of use, a ton of features, and perhaps the most amazing VR game to date, Half-Life Alex. It had full five-finger tracking controllers, over-ear headphones for crystal clear sound, great comfort, and just overall it was an absolute beast. And it still is. Finnish company Vario also launched its first headset, the Vario VR1. This high-end device was solely focused on enterprises. It came with a bionic display, which was basically a high-res micro display plus a standard VR display. 
The aim of this unique approach was to mimic human vision as closely as possible. It was and still is used in more professional settings though. Automotive design, aviation and medical training centers usually have the Vario VR1 for virtual training. It was also super expensive at around 6000 bucks, so not a lot of regular VR consumers bought it, if any. It was also that same year when Pimax really started cooking and became known for pushing the boundaries of VR further than anyone else, releasing the Pimax 8K, a crazy high-resolution headset that no one had ever expected. Despite such amazing devices on the market, a lot of people were still skeptical about VR, but for hardcore fans, VR's rapid advancement was extremely impressive. Just seven years after the Rift was launched, headsets had become completely different. They were loaded with sensors and better screens and were available in every price range. But despite that, Facebook knew this wasn't enough to grab the attention of a wider market. There were still a lot of people who preferred just sitting on their couch playing on a console of their choice. So to try and get them on board, they launched the Oculus Quest. This standalone headset was absolutely crazy when it was launched, it immediately got sold out everywhere. It was chock full of features and had some of the best screens in the game for that time. It came with a Snapdragon 835 chipset and 4 gigs of RAM, OLED screens, high resolution, and specs that allowed it to run completely standalone games without any PC or console. It was the world's first properly good wireless standalone headset. Over $5 million worth of sales were recorded after its launch, making it the most popular VR headset at the time. Obviously, it went through several software updates and new features were continuously added, but it was the perfect depiction of how far VR tech had come. Just a few years before that, nobody could even imagine such high-resolution screens, powerful processors, and several other features that Facebook managed to add to the Quest. But again, their research into making the most incredible VR headset of all time and capturing the entire market never stopped. Just a year later, they came out with the next generation of the Quest called the Quest 2. This was the GOAT of the Quest line, and it pretty much set the standard for what VR tech would or should look like in the future. This was an even more advanced version of its predecessor, with better features and fewer bugs. It came with a new Snapdragon XR2 processor, a higher resolution screen, and added comfort. There was one downgrade in the screen department though. The original Oculus Quest used OLED screens, whereas the Quest 2 came with an LCD screen. Apart from that, Oculus only made it better than the previous version in every way. The very next year, HTC released the Vive Pro 2, which offered an impressive 2448 by 2448 resolution for each eye. It came with a refresh rate of 120Hz, had an optional adapter that made it fully wireless and used Steam VR tracking. HP also came back stronger than ever with the Reverb G2, a PC VR headset with fantastic specs, developed in cooperation with Valve, which went on to become an extremely popular choice among enthusiasts. And Vario was also back with its first ever consumer headset, the Vario Aero. We also saw the first real competitor to the Oculus Quest line, the Pico Neo 3. This was unfortunately never available in the United States, which hindered sales considerably, but it did provide some much needed competition at the time. Meta was still not satisfied though, so they decided to take on the enterprise market with the Quest Pro, which was released in October 2022. Launched originally at 1500 bucks, this was the most expensive VR headset accessible to consumers at the time. It had quite a few additional features compared to the Quest 1 and 2, like eye tracking and face tracking, better screens, lenses, and a few other upgrades. This ended up gaining more adoption in the consumer market than it did with companies, and for good reason. Meta also announced during that time that they were going to spend nearly $10 billion on Facebook Reality Labs, which was focused solely on AR and VR development. According to a report by the Financial Times, Meta had spent over $80 billion on VR and AR development since acquiring Oculus back in 2014. In 2024, Meta invested $19.9 billion into Reality Labs alone and plans on investing over $20 billion more in 2025. That means they're going all in, with the total investment coming up to over $100 billion. But there was a company secretly working on releasing their first VR headset. Finally, in 2023, Apple launched the Vision Pro, fashionably late as always. This was and still is extremely overpriced at 3500 bucks. However, in true Apple fashion, this was not a VR device. Oh no, it was a spatial computing device, but Apple just gonna be Apple. 
Nonetheless, this spatial computer doesn't come with any controllers, which means there's no hardcore gaming available, but that was never their focus. 2023 was far from done when it comes to unexpected launches, because that year we saw three more headsets that were about to change the game for good. First off, the Pimax Crystal, an incredibly high-resolution headset that, while large and bulky, offered a visual experience like nothing else could. On the opposite side of the size spectrum, we saw the launch of the Big Screen Beyond, a headset with a custom-built facial interface personalized for each user that can literally fit in a can of Coke. This showed the entire market how small the technology could become, and while it has its drawbacks, it's still a marvel of engineering. And that brings us to the MetaQuest 3. Launched in October 2023, this mixed reality headset had more features than all of its predecessors and really took the market by storm. It offered a significantly improved resolution of 2160 by 2160 per eye, and for reference, the Quest 2 had an 1832 by 1920 resolution. Along with that, the Quest 3 came with a Snapdragon XR2 Gen 2 processor, better lenses, and a much bigger field of view. It still had the fully wireless, standalone, and PC VR compatibility features like the Quest 1 and Quest 2. And the best thing about it was its price. Under the $500 price tag, I'd say this is still the best VR headset on the market right now for the general consumer. Love them or hate them, Meta has been doing wonders for the development and advancement of VR technology. ByteDance has also tried to compete with their Pico headsets, but let's be real, they're nowhere close to the market share that Meta's Quest line has. However, other companies like HTC, Sony, and a few more players in the VR game didn't stop releasing products either. In 2023, Sony also released their second version of the PSVR, which was designed exclusively for the PS5. It has 120Hz refresh rate and comes with a 4K HDR OLED display for each eye. Inside-out tracking, eye tracking, and all other features came standard. Games like Horizon Call of the Mountain, Gran Turismo 7, and even Resident Evil Village blew people away. But sadly, almost everything else that came after that was just a port of a Quest or PC VR game. Companies like Pimax and Vario, who are among the pioneers of VR headsets, are also not holding back. In fact, Pimax released my favorite VR headset of all time, the Pimax Crystal Lite, which took all the feedback they got on the Crystal and improved everything that people didn't like about the Crystal. And this brings us to current times. This year, Pimax introduced its latest VR headset, the Pimax Dream Air. It is the world's smallest VR headset with 8K resolution, pancake lenses, and OLED screens. Their Crystal Supermodel, announced in 2024, is also mind-blowingly insane since it offers a 3840 by 3840 resolution for each eye. I even have an initial review video on the channel if you want to check it out next, but let's just say it's absolutely incredible. Vario's latest release was the XR4 series, which was also super impressive. However, its use is still best for professional settings. We're three months into 2025 already, and if we consider how much VR technology has advanced since 2012, it's simply fascinating. The complexity of lenses, using sensors that track head, eye, and hand movements, and everything else that goes into creating a VR headset is proof of how far the tech has come in just over a decade. Most of us have become so used to fast computers, laptops, and insanely capable smartphones. Now, because VR technology is so complex, it still feels behind the curve and that's why a lot of consumers aren't as impressed with it. VR is just getting started and the next few years will continue to innovate at an even higher pace than the past decade. As always, thanks for watching, a sub would be great if you enjoyed this and I'll see you all in the next one. Cheers guys!